Good evening, everyone. I'd like to call this City Commission meeting of February 12th to order. If you would all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance and 10 seconds of silence. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. We had uh, four UCR crimes reported this last month. They consisted of a commercial burglary, vehicle burglary, and three thefts. Uh, we had 17 people arrested in the city uh, with a total of 26 charges, 10 of those felony and 15 misdemeanors. Uh, seven of those misdemeanors were traffic offenses. We responded to 846 uh, events in the city totaling 100, 1,167 units that responded for those. Majority of those were traffic stops, just under half. 185 of those were just basically traffic stops. Um, and as far as car crashes in the city, we've only had two reported this past month. Um, one occurred in the morning, one occurred in the evening, uh, both off of Gulf Boulevard. 352 citations and warnings were issued in the city over the last month. Um, majority of those were enforced at Gulf Boulevard and Fifth Avenue. Any questions? Any member of the commission have a question or comment for the show? Well, thank you. Thank you. Thanks for being a part of us now. Thank you. Very happy to be here. Chief Mike Burton, if you would come forward next. <coughs> Sorry, man. Thank you for the opportunity tonight. I know you've got a full agenda, so I'll. Uh, I'll be quick. We have a very important referendum on March 12th concerning your fire district uh, that has significant impacts, the referendum itself. Some historical pieces, our, our charter goes back to 1953. Our charter still requires that any change to either ad valorem or, or non-ad valorem assessment be approved by the voters each and every time. The last increase that was approved by the voters to which we actually received any of those funds was 2008. So we're operating on 2008 dollars. There was a referendum in 2016. Uh, the, the majority of the voters approved it. There was an allegation that the ballot language was misleading and a judicial order received that the language was not clear enough and the election results were overturned. So it's important to note that none of those additional funds were ever received by the district. Our current challenges we face uh, our, our fleet is aging and not in a graceful way. We're having significant issues keeping our fleet up and operating. Uh, two of our three fire stations need replaced. Uh, one of those is 45 years old, the other is 54 years old. All of our stations have to be evacuated for tropical events. And from a, a staff perspective, we've had one general wage increase for our staff since 2010. Uh, if, if we don't see an increase in revenue uh, soon, um, I'm concerned about our, our future. The last three out of four years, we've spent reserves to remain operational. <coughs> that's not spending reserves to make improvement, that's simply to maintain our current operations in three of the last four years. And barring an increase in revenue or painful service reductions, we're going to simply be in an untenable financial situation uh, no later than 2024, which would require changes significantly ahead of that. In very easy terms, our, uh, our revenues are $5.1 million. Our expenses this year to maintain operations 
are 5.4. And your, your operating cost should not exceed your revenue. That's the position we're in. We're $249,000 uh, deficit for this year. We assembled a community-based stakeholder group to look at the issue. Uh, we met uh, 11 times in this very building. It was made up of residents from each of our cities and towns, the mainland area, business owners, and elected officials. Uh, those 11 meetings, we covered a lot of ground uh, concerning the district, from funding to referendum to ad valorem versus non-ad valorem, the pros and cons of each, a lot of comparisons to other departments. Uh, the group worked really, really hard, and two of them are here, Kelly Sister and Matt Loader, uh, committed an inordinate amount of time to our efforts. That group recommended a $100 flat fee annual increase against a group of property types, mostly residential, um, as defined by the property appraiser. And the, the will of that group was very, very strong to me. Make sure the ballot language is abundantly clear. No vagueness, no ambiguity in the ballot language. And we worked really hard uh, on that. The, uh, the ballot question, um, we were able to fit it into 15 words, uh, the ballot title, and it's authorization to increase non ad valorem assessment rate for delivery of fire protection and rescue services. We went back through the judicial ruling to look at all the concerns that were raised in that process to be sure that uh, we didn't have any repeats on that. So the proposed assessment for single residential units would go to $360, and that is single family residence, apartments, condominiums, timeshares, and mobile homes a $100 increase to base commercial units, and a $100 increase to motel units up to $265. This increase would generate approximately $1.2 million annually, which would provide us some relief, allow us to initiate some long deferred maintenance, start an apparatus replacement plan, and start a capital plan to get us um, some new facilities in the right locations. To give you an example of what uh, three of our neighboring districts charge, uh, the Clearwater Fire District, Seminole Fire District, and Largo District, uh, as a sample, a $312,000 taxable value, which is pretty consistent here. Uh, what we're seeking is $360. Uh, the Clearwater Fire District millage is $1,002 for that amount. Seminole is $611, and Largo is $1,011. Excuse me, $1,111. <coughs> Um, I, I can't advocate in my position, I can educate and I can urge you, please vote. The uh, mail ballots went out February 7th, the elections are on March 12th, and uh, please get out and vote. If there's any questions, I'm happy to answer those. Does anyone on the commission have a question for Chief Thank you, Chief. Thank you for the time. At this time is public comment. Any member of the audience may come forward, give his or her name and address, and state any comment or concern that he or she may have regarding any matter over which the City Commission has control, excluding items that would be on the agenda tonight. Thank you. Good evening. Hi. My name is Kelly Sister. I live at 448 Harbor Drive South here in town. Last month at this meeting, I spoke about our fire district's new referendum, and I think there might have been some confusion about whether I was speaking on behalf of the fire district since I served on that task force. The district is not allowed to advocate an official position on the referendum item, as you just heard the Chief Burton say. Some task force members might have different views than myself, so I can't speak for that whole group either. But I do want to offer my personal views again. Uh, my husband, John Fanson, and I were among the biggest opponents of the 2016 referendum, so you might be surprised to hear me say that we personally support this $100 increase. I have a great deal of confidence in Chief Burton's willingness to work with Pinellas County now, and that will be necessary in the effort to build or rebuild fire stations. John and I are committed to helping the district get some additional funding via our county EMS tax. And there may be a time in the future where the city has an opportunity to partner with the district to help replace our 50-year-old fire station that's located in the business triangle. Thank you. Thank you, Kelly. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time? And please state your name and your address for the record. Good evening, Darlene Cavanaugh. I actually live at 361 Mill Bunker and Miller Bluffs. However, my family lives at 450 Harvard Drive South where I grew up. 
Um, my son uh, had a double lung transplant two years ago, and he really enjoyed the racquetball court that you had out here. He was sad to see it go. I love all the improvements with the pickleball and everything. I know there's some small walls around. Is it possible that a racquetball? I've heard there's talk on other websites about people missing the racquetball court because there isn't one in our local area. Um, and he's residing here at 450 Harbor Drive South. Is it possible that one could be put back in? Um, at this time, we take questions, but we don't. Okay. But we'll we'll have the city manager get back to you okay. on that. All right. Thank you. Matt Loader from Crabby Milton in Rocks Beach. I, uh, I have to tell you, I was on the uh, task force, and that's retired now, but I, we are definitely uh, for this, uh, for this uh, referendum to, to go ahead and get more money. But I got to know Chief Burton from working on that task force with him. I think he's an honorable guy. I think he's the fire chief that can help us go ahead and protect our, our neighborhoods and our, our citizens. And, and the way I looked at it was is that if we do have a ca catastrophic event, we need the very best trained, you know, uh, first responders to be able to go ahead and help us. And even, you know, it could be a personal catastrophic event, heart attack, a, a, a crisis, and of course we all have those at time to time, or a hurricane, or some large scale event. But we can't afford to have a, a, a first responders or fire service that isn't prepared. And unfortunately that costs money. And, to be ready for something that may not have happened and we'll be fine with that. And I, I, I just figured I would get those words in the comment. All right, thank you. Thank you, Matt. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time? Hi, thank good you. evening. John Fansteel for Horry Cover Drive South. I just wanted to agree with Matt and uh, my wife also that uh, we were strongly against the very deceptive fire tax of 2016, but we are in favor of Chief Burton and that increase. And on another subject, it was good to see the attendance at the last meeting and hear a lot of discussion about the pros and cons of term limits. Now, there is another way around this. Um, in our city code, uh, section 2275, you can do a straw poll. And it's non-binding, and that can be put on the next election to get a feel for whether the city, whether the residents want to go ahead with term limits without specifically deciding what exactly those term limits so it would be like, of course, if you want to go ahead and make a decision on term limits, uh, then of course you can put it on the referendum and voters can have their approval of that too. That's all. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward? Yeah, Lonnie Fitton, 210 First Street. Um, I just wanted to ask if there's a reason the fire trucks need to use their air brake when they're flying down First Street back to the fire station. Because I hear it all the time. <laughs> <laughs> So I don't think they should be driving that fast that they actually need to hear the break. Okay, well, he's here tonight. I'm sure he heard you. But... <laughs> Is there anyone else at this time? Public comment. Hi there. Are we fun? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, 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 they did. So the commission could approve 
a change in building height through the variance process before the existence of the PUD? Yes, upon application of the uh, property owner. Thank you. And with the passage of the PUD, um, if a PUD application were to come before the commission and be approved, would the city manager be able to increase the building heights without coming back to the commission? No, uh, there is a provision within the PUD ordinance allowing the city manager to make more restrictive um, changes. That is, if somebody wants less space, less units, uh, less landscaping perhaps, those sort of things can be accommodated, but a city manager and staff would not have the ability under the ordinance to unilaterally increase building heights um, or living area ratios. So are you saying that both before the PUD existed and after the PUD existed, the sole group that has the authority to approve changes in building heights would be the city commission? Is that what you're saying? Yes, the ordinance did not change the um, decision-making jurisdiction of this body. I just wanted the record to reflect that. Thank you, Randy. Okay. While we're on that, may I ask a question? I know years and years ago, to get higher limits on the height, it used to be that there you had to be a supermajority vote on our commission. Is that still in effect? I'm not aware of the historical aspect of it. Um, if you're asking about the what the code presently says, I, in all my service to you, I can say I've not committed your code to an encyclopedic memory. Okay. Um, <laughs> But I, I can tell you that that was not, nothing in the PUD ordinance changed the nature of, of the votes. Okay. Anyone else? Thank you, Randy. Greg, do you have a report tonight? Good evening. I just have a couple things in the spirit of the agenda and the brief. Uh, back in the back by the, the front, the table where the, the agendas are, there's a recycle can. Those are the recycle cans that will be delivered to the public between March the 25th and the 29th. It has a label on the top that describes what should be what should be put in the can and not put in the can. It's in Spanish and English. So our staff will be working with the contractor to get those out during that, that time frame. Uh, the only other thing I have is that you in your packet you have the quarterly financial reports. And if you have any questions about those, either Dan or I'll answer the questions about those now. Does anyone have a question for Dan or Greg at this time? No? All right, then we will start with the city commission. And tonight we're going to start with Commissioner Robel. This is our last meeting. That's my last meeting. So, uh, first of all, I'd like to say to Greg, I did get some comments from people I ran into over the weekend about the volleyball courts and said it's the best volleyball courts they've seen around in a long time and everything, but there's nowhere to park because that parking lot is filled up still with holiday inn people, rental people. When I was down there on Saturday, the actual jet ski and parasail trucks were parked in their advertising right up front where everyone could see them if they went around. And I'm just wondering if one of these days we could get something where it's you know more for the residents or maybe put some resident parking down there like we have on the beaches. Okay. All right. Uh, first of all, I'm very honored to have been elected to serve as a commissioner in the city I love. I have learned a lot up here, both good and bad, and actually alienated a great friend in town by me being up here with the decisions I've made. I am sure I have let down some of my supporters by not running for re-election, and I am truly sorry. I look forward to continuing being an active volunteer, as I have been for the last 20 years, and will probably be sitting in the audience of the meetings when I retire. I might run again. Thank you all. Said on all those accounts, uh, especially the fire thing. Um, 
I had the opportunity back in about 2008, working with Sandy Sullivan, who was a past uh, assistant fire chief in Pinellas Park. And we were trying to raise, I think, a dollar ten more. It was not much to have people pay. And we'd gone through several years without the fire department getting anything. So we took uh, our camera out and we shot some pictures of homes. We went to the Multilist, which is one advantage of being a real estate agent. I guess I have that capability. And we were able to find like homes in various communities that would match square footage, taxation, was, was built in there to show the value and the deal that we had by just raising it a dollar ten. Uh, I'm happy to say that that hit home. We actually had uh, one person from Palm Harbor write to, to me on email and he said, what's wrong with the people of Indian Rocks Beach? I only wish we had such a value on our fire service. So I am wholeheartedly for the $100. Uh, I think it's, it's a good value for the fire protection that they provide. And then Saturday on another issue, uh, the Beach Arts Center is having a fundraiser. It's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, Nick and I are going to be emceeing the <coughs> auction part of it. And, and, uh, we're not promising anything, but bring money. <laughs> Thank you. Bring your wallet, absolutely. Commissioner Nick. Thank you, Madam Mayor. I wanted to introduce everybody to George. George was a uh, happy meeting for me. Um, I was up getting uh, food for my dogs and um, happened to run into a, a dog that was there with uh, folks that were from uh, Fluff Animal Rescue. Mm -hmm. um, George was awesome, spent some time with him, played around with him for a while, happened to post uh, something about him and he was adopted into our neighborhood. Uh, Lauren and Chad from IRB Glass now have a uh, new puppy in addition to their family, so I was very proud to uh, home for an awesome puppy and uh, they've been looking for a dog so it's a perfect match so great story great community. thank you well as you know this is valentine's week and but what you may not know is that in coastal living indian rocks beach was voted number two as the most romantic and beautiful beach in this country with Honolulu, Hawaii being number one, which of course I don't agree with that because we're number one. So uh, that being said, I'm here to tell you a few things that will be going on this month. The first Monday of the month I have Monday with the mayor and the next one I have will be March 4th from 4 to 6.30 in our city auditorium and you are more than happy to come and visit with me and talk to me about any issues or basically anything you want to talk about. I'm there and I'm more than willing and happy to see you. February 13th, which is tomorrow, is the dedication of our pickleball court at 9 a.m. More than happy to come out to that. The homeowners are having a Valentine mixer on February 14th and that is at 18 on the rocks. Our Winterfest is February 16th, Saturday and that's from 10 to 4 and then we have the Venetian Gala from 7 to 10 and if you come they will have a mask for you so you don't have to bring your own. Also just FYI at the Winterfest there will be a dog contest. Dogs will be dressed up in costumes and um, hopefully that's at 1230 in Calgary and you will come and see that. We will be February 22nd at 6 p.m. we are opening our ballpark for the season and A2K, February 23rd, we'll have a service Saturday, and hopefully some of you will come to that. I would like to do a special shout out for everyone, a quick story about the food pantry. And we have an executive group that meets once a month, and it's one member of a lot of the different groups that we have in the community, one of which was the food pantry. And Connie Corin was the member that was there and had explained to us that during the month of February, the food was so low, having to do with the shutdown of the government, that they had zero meat and they were very concerned about the people that they had to come into the food pantry. So we sat there and we made a Facebook post, which I posted on my Facebook, <coughs> And I have to tell you, there were 73 shares on that post, which is the most I've ever seen on anything. And 
We were at the library on Sunday. They took a donation form. I know the homeowners have done a donation. I know that everyone has reached out in this community to help. And I wrote an email to Connie Corinne, who is one of the um, directors of the food pantry. And this was what she wrote to me back. Cookie, thank you so much. The response has been overwhelming. It has been so heartwarming to know that our wonderful Indian Rocks community is always there for the food pantry when, when we reach out, reach out to them. I am speaking Monday evening at the A2K meeting as we don't know what might happen if the government closes down again next week. We appreciate all that all of you do for the food pantry. Many blessings, Connie. So I just thought that was a great story of our community and how everyone came together to help for this month um, to, to help with the food pantry and make sure that we have enough food for everyone. My last little thing that I, I want to mention is we will be a partner with Pine Ellis County, the City of Indian Rocks Beach, in a Red Tide Summit which will be March 28th, Thursday, from 6 o'clock to 8.30. And I'm going to ask the commissioners if you will help with that um, at that event. And what it's going to be is an open discussion, almost like a classroom. There will be several experts there in all different fields. Our city manager will also um, represent city managers and how cities that were affected by the red tide how we worked, what things that we could do different next time, all the things that we did well. And um, I'm incredibly pleased at how this has come about. It's going to, again, be at the Sheraton Sand Key. There will be social media. It will be sent out to all the cities. And whether you are an elected official or you're a business owner, uh, resident, anyone who would like to attend is more than welcome to a, to come to this event. So um, that being said, with that, are there any additions or deletions tonight? Okay, and a consent uh, agenda. Is there approval of the minutes? Um, there's one item on the consent agenda, Mayor. It's I may approval of the January 8, 2019 regular city commission meeting minutes. Is there a motion? Beach, Florida, providing for amendments to the Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 110 Zoning, Article 1 in general, Section 110-1 Definitions to define paid parking lots, amending Article 3, District Designation and Regulations, Division 1 generally, Section 110-131 Establishment of Zoning District, Subsection 6, Business Zoning District-B, to provide for paid parking lots as a permitted use in the Business District Triangle Overlay Zone, amending Article 3, District Designation and Regulations, Division 1, Generally, Section 110-135, Business District Triangle Overlay Zone, to allow the operation of paid parking lots, providing for repeal of ordinances or parts of ordinances in conflict herewith to the extent of such conflict, providing for separability, providing for renumbering, and providing for an effective date. This has been a second and final reading of Ordinance Number 2019-01 by Title Only. Randy, do you have anything that you want to add from last month? Um, I think that the I have no staffing to add on this. Um, I, I, as this is the second reading, I, I trust the body is familiar with this. What this contemplates is the, as the title suggests, permission for the creation going forward of paid parking lots in the specified district and that district only. Um, this is not specific to any one lot, but to the district as a whole. And it will be a, a um, permitted use within that district upon passage of this ordinance. I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, I, again, noting the staffing uh, in the past of the uh, Board of Adjustment uh, recommended um, declining or denying this, this ordinance. This body considered it, considered public comment, had its own debate, and reached a different conclusion on first reading, approved it, and here we sit on second reading. Does anyone on the commission have a comment or question for Randy at this time? If 
not, I'll open the public hearing. Is there anyone who would like to speak on this agenda item at this time? Gordon Barsky, 708 Beach Trail. Number B. Um, I don't know if I have a lot to say. I have a couple of questions. If uh, the, the, the business triangle, does that include the west side of Gulf Boulevard does it, or only in the business triangle on the east side of Gulf Boulevard? I think that's important. I think the USF study at one point said that we should do put up a parking lot. Um, I don't know if that's going to be consideration. If you're talking about on-street parking, I, I don't know if that's a consideration. My other, my other comment is, what about the cost versus the revenue? Uh, somebody's going to have to maintain it. Somebody's going to have to pick up uh, the money. Somebody's going to, somebody's going to have to go around. Are we going to hire a, a parking uh, meter like they do in Clearwater, uh, where they have the, the meter people walking around, or in St. Pete? I don't know if all that has been taken into consideration, but I think it should be before this is passed. Thank you. For, um, for the clarity of this body, this is not considering the establishment of a municipal lot. Right. This is uh, the establishment of a permitted use for private property owners. So that would include the city, that if the city owned or acquired property in that district and desired, it would be able to. This is not a contemplated city project, but rather a permitted use within a zoning district change. Is there anyone else in the public who would like to comment at this time? Yeah, I'm Lonnie Fitton, 210 First Street. I live right in the middle of the business triangle. Um, are these private parking lots going to be regulated in any way, the same way as public parking lots or business parking lots? Are they going to be required to have ballards, <coughs> parking bumpers, all that stuff, or just open up the lot and let them come in? That's my question. Is there anyone else at this time who would like to speak on this agenda item? I'll always do it. That's not a city attorney question. Um, yeah, anybody that would construct a paid park a lot on private property, they would have to build it to the standards of the city. And, and, and to answer Gordon's other question, this only applies to the business triangle district, which is the east side of the floor, the triangle. It's, Thank you. If there is no one else who'd like to speak on this agenda item, I'm going to close the public hearing and I'm looking for a motion. Motion to approve ordinance 2019-01. Is there a second? Second. Is there any comments from the maker? I think we covered this extensively last time. Agree. Okay. Dan, will you call the roll, please? Commissioner um, Palumba? Yes. Commissioner Rovell? Yes. Commissioner Hanna? Yes. Commissioner Hoofnagel? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Thank you. Motion carries. Agenda item 6B, ordinance number 2019-02, public hearing and a second and final reading. Randy, would you please read this by title? Happily Mayor, City of Indian Rock Speech, ordinance number 2019-02. An ordinance of the City of Indian Rocks Beach, Florida, amending Section 106-44 and Section 106-45 of the Land Development Code concerning removal of dead or diseased trees, providing for enforcement, making related findings, providing for codification, severability, and an effective date. This has been a second and final reading of Ordinance Number 2019-02 by title only. Again, Mayor, I don't have any um, new or different staffing to report on this ordinance. Uh, different than the first reading. Again, what this does is it cleans up some idiosyncrasies and, and conflicting language within this section of the code to make more clear the city's ability to cite and enforce on properties where dead or diseased trees are not removed at the uh, behest of the city. Again, this only concerns dead or diseased trees and it provides for an objective means for the city to make that determination if need be. Um, it also provides for certain species that cannot be sold or planted anew in the community. This does not address the removal of existing uh, trees or flora of those species. So this is not a go around and start identifying every single tree that matches this description. Um, for those members of the public present, uh, the city will not be, uh, upon passage of this ordinance, going around removing 
every tree meeting that description, should you be familiar with this, uh, the text of the ordinance. And with that, I have nothing else to add, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Does anyone on the commission have a question for the city attorney? If not, I will open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the public who would like to speak at this time concerning this agenda item? Hearing none, I'll close the public hearing, and I'm looking for a motion. I'll make a motion to approve. Ordinance 2019-02. Second. Okay, any comments from the neighbor? Second. Okay, Dan, would you please call the roll, please? Commissioner Palumba? Yes. Commissioner Hanna? Yes. Commissioner Hupenko? Yes. Commissioner Robel? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes. Motion carries. We are now on agenda item 6C, ordinance number 2019-03. This is also a second and final reading. Agenda item 6C, Mayor, this is ordinance number 2019-03. City of Indian Rock Speech, ordinance number 2019-03. An ordinance of the City of Indian Rock Speech, Florida, amending the Code of Ordinances by amending Chapter 15. Schedule of fees, Article 5, Library, Section 15-41, Borrowing Periods, Fines for Late Return of Material, Audio, CD, DVDs, and Blu-ray, by Section 15-42, Fees for Replacement of Damaged or Missing Material, by Section 15-43, amend, amend, <coughs> Miscellaneous Library Fees and Charges, by Providing for an Adjustment to the Library Services Fee Schedule, Providing for Severability, Providing for the Repeal of Ordinances or Parts of Ordinances in Conflict herewith to the extent of such conflict, and providing for an effective date. This has been a second and final reading of Ordinance Number 2019-03 by title only, Mayor. Greg, do you have anything that you'd like to add to this report? Uh, just, just briefly, what this does is it clarifies three different sections of the, the ordinance. It, it reduces or clarifies the fact that if you're late with the um, return of the book, the maximum charge is $5, you just did a replacement cost. Second thing it does is it, it specifies that if you do not re return an item, it, it will be charged the listed value of book in the library database. But most importantly, what it does, instead of a $2 per visit charge to use the computers in the library, that if this is passed, uh, residents and visitors alike can go to the library and use the computers without charge. Thank you, Greg. Does anyone on the commission have a question or comment at this time for the city manager or for our city attorney? If not, I'm going to open the public hearing. Is there anyone in the audience who would like to speak on this agenda item at this time? Hearing none, I will close the public hearing and I'm looking for a motion. Motion to pass 2019-03. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Okay. Is there any comments from the maker? Dan, would you please call the roll? Vice Mayor Hoopnagel? Yes. Commissioner Robel? Yes. Commissioner Hanna? Yes. Commissioner Coloma? Yes. Mayor Kennedy? Yes, thank you. Motion carries. At this time, we are on agenda item 6D, ABT 06 2019, Aqua Prime, Seafood and Steak, 213 Golf Boulevard, and 208 First Street. This is a quasi-judicial procedure, and Randy, would you like to present from this floor? Uh, <laughs> thank you, Mayor. Uh, uh, going forward, uh, we will, in an abundance of caution, approach this as a quasi-judicial proceeding for that purpose. Um, it is important that you, again, recall that you are not acting in a legislative, but rather a judicial capacity. Uh, to that end, has anybody here conducted any site visits for the limited purpose of evaluating uh, this application, that is to say, I'm not asking if you are familiar with a business that exists in the corporate boundaries of your town, but if you went to the site for the purpose of analyzing the application before you this evening. Let the record reflect all respondent in the negative. Did any, any member of this body have any ex parte communications with the owners or their agents, that is, the owners of this particular business, or there um, anybody who you knew to be an agent or representative of the owners with respect to the application before you this evening? Randy, I did actually look at the property. Okay, uh, the mayor. So that you know that. Okay, you looked at the property for the Do you think that in any way affected your ability to um, adjudicate this matter in a 
nonpartisan? No, sir. Not. Manner? Okay, thank you. If I, you know, I drive by there. That's not what I'm asking. <laughs> okay. No, but I'm just saying I've looked at the lot. I see what it is. Uh, I mean, I didn't go in there to visit it, but I know the property and I've seen what they're doing now. I understand. Is there anybody on the body again uh, going to my second question? Who's had any ex parte communications? I have, I have a question. Why is this quasi judicial? Exactly. Um, this is quasi judicial uh, because the body is considering the propriety pro priority of allowing this and cannot do so in an arbitrary and capricious manner. Uh, and uh, that's as much as I'll say at this point. Uh, with that, um, anybody who intends to offer any evidence before this body that is any testimony, including staff, the agent, or their, uh, or their uh, representative, will you please stand and raise your right hand? Do you swear or affirm the testimony you're going to give this body is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes. And that includes, is there anybody else who intends to speak on this matter and offer evidence before this body? Do you swear, or all members of the public that intend to speak, do you swear or affirm the testimony you're going to give this body is the truth, the whole? Stand and raise your right hand. All persons who intend to speak before this body on this agenda item, please stand and raise your right hand. Thank you. Thank you. Do you swear or affirm the testimony you are going to give this body is the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Thank you, folks. With that, Mayor, I, I tender to the staff. And did you want to Subject, this is ABT 06-2019, Aqua Prime Operations, LLC, doing business as Aqua Prime Seafood and Steaks, 213 Gulf Boulevard, Indian Rocks Beach, Florida, requesting a permanent extension to the approved 4COP-SRX for Aqua Prime Seafood and Steaks. Madam Clerk. Yeah, okay. Oops, sorry. The applicant has requested a permanent extension to the approved 4COP SRX Aquapine Beverage designation for Aquapine Seafood and Steaks located at 213 to extend its license to include the recently purchased adjacent lot located at 208 First Street. The applicant is proposing to serve barbecue from the side kitchen window of the Aquapine restaurant when it is not open to the public. Patrons would order and pick up their meal from the side window and enjoy their meal on the picnic-style atmosphere created on the recently purchased vacant lot on Papers and Bricks located at 208 First Street. And that's mostly the narrative. And now I have some pictures to go over with. This is the side, this is the service window, the side service window. This is the new lot they recently purchased. You see the gravel part, and then behind that is, behind the two trucks, is the brick area, <coughs> and to the side is the side service window. And that area would accommodate four, um, 40 patrons, it would be um, 10, 10 tables with four um, chairs at each one. Aqua Prime also has purchased the Lighthouse Donut Shop at 215 Golf Boulevard for its employee parking. And that's the donut shop, and you can see their um, parking. This is the back parking lot of Aqua Prime. This is the front parking or side parking of Aqua Prime. This is the um, behind Aqua Prime, the outdoor seating. And this is the front of Aqua Prime. And this, and I know you can't see it that well, but it's also in your packet, is an aerial view. And if you can see it, it shows you the donut shop. It shows you the recently purchased property, the parking lots. And I do have one rainbow JV parking lot to give you the whole scenario of the whole complex. And they're just asking for it to be extended, and they have told us that they will not be open. Aqua Prime will not be open when the barbecue service is open. And if you have any questions. What was that last thing? People now. Aqua Prime restaurant will not be open when the barbecue side window is open. That will be closed. It will be open. So when Aqua Prime is open, their barbecue will be closed. So they're only doing this, I guess. You can 
they're they're only going to be doing this between up until they open at three. Correct. And then they won't be using that lot for right. They sure, don't have um, for. They don't have the ample parking. Have a little bit at the same time. And in the license, there's no restriction, though, right? This is a general extension of the premises. Correct. For the, um, they're not, they don't have enough parking for a lot of people at the same time. Let me ask it differently. If this were approved during the business hours when the restaurant is open, would people be allowed to enjoy adult beverages out on these tables? No. So that lot becomes closed as soon as the restaurant opens? Correct. Randy, is that correct? As the application, the application before you does not seek a, or as I, as I see the application materials, it is a application to operate on that space. There are no stated parameters or, or binding <coughs> restriction. Um, it states a plan uh, yeah. and, and ambitions, but it is not a That's stated a restriction. Um, from the city's perspective, what this would allow is for the for the operation on that lot, it is not about, in its current form, about a, an application for a restriction on certain hours of operation, as I read the application materials. In the backup letter, it says, when off the prime is open for business, the barbecue kitchen will not be operating. Okay. And so if, 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 in its approval, you wish to make that a condition, mm -hmm. um, then, you know, as, as the applicant has represented that that is their plan and you are not binding them to anything more restrictive than what they represented that they intend to do. Thank you. Is there anyone else on the commission who has a comment at this time before I bring up the applicant? Bill? Mm -hmm. No, I'll wait. wait. Okay. We'll do it after. If the applicant would like to come forward at this time, state your name and your address. <coughs> Good evening, Madam Mayor, Commission members. Um, Shane Crawford, 15332 Harbor Drive in Madera Beach. Um, I think there's been a lot of misgivings, so if I can just take two minutes, I'll just back backtrack a little bit and walk everybody through it. Uh, 281st Street had an old, decrepit cottage and a four-unit apartment complex on it. It wasn't saveable. We bought the lot just because it was adjacent to Aqua Prime. To be honest with you, not even really knowing what we were going to do with it. Um, we decided to, and this goes to the gentleman over here's question, um, Aqua Prime used to serve lunch. We used to open up at 11 o'clock in the morning and serve lunch until, I think, 3, 3.30. Now what we're going to do is open up at 3, but instead at 3, Aqua Prime, and then run this barbecue from 11 to 3. So in theory, nothing really changes. Um, at, at, when Aqua Prime is open, our hours will never coexist. So if the barbecue is open from 11 to 3, Aqua Prime will work you know, from 3 to 10 or 3 to 11 or whatever's allowed. So with that, I can entertain any questions. I know it sounds a little compatible, but it's actually pretty simple. So basically, if you guys close at 10 o'clock, you're not going to go over and start serving beer and have people in that lot? At 10 p.m.? Yeah. Only if the city allows and there, there's plenty of bars and restaurants still open until one, two in the morning. Um, we haven't necessarily decided on that yet. We just know that we were not going to operate cohesively. Do any, anyone else have a question for the applicant? Yes. Um, so the, are you, in any way uncomfortable if the commission were to severely restrict the access to that lot or outside of the hours which you indicated in your letter? Well, I don't know if the, the hours were specific. I think the hours are from 11 to 3 and then Aqua Prime was 3 until 10 or maybe 3 until 11. And then I don't think that we addressed hours after.
after that, but we did state that they wouldn't coexist. So I think the city code allows, you know, I, don't, I don't know who's in town, but there's bars and restaurants open until 1, 2 in the morning. Uh, we would like to at least be afforded that same opportunity. That's enough. So that's, that's a little different. I, I'm not saying that, that we're going to do that. All I'm saying is that I would hate to limit ourselves to that. Thank you. Bill, anyone else would like to ask any questions of the applicant? If I can make one more statement, I think our friend, her code could stay open until 2 in the morning. We close at 10 o'clock. Again, we just want to have that. Flexibility in case we do want to, you know, run run again the, the barbecue part of this after hours. So, to. for the sake of clarity and the record, sir, does Aqua Prime already possess an alcohol beverage license from the state? Yes. Okay, and this is a lot that is contiguous to Aqua Prime. Yes, sir. Okay, so you're seeking your current license does not allow you to operate on. Yeah, this just lot because, just because we just purchased it, mm -hmm. so it'd be the permanent. Is that the right term? Permanent extension of permanent. <coughs> That's how it's been phrased in the application, yes. Yeah. So, as I asked you earlier, so we don't know that their state, because they have a state liquor license and an alcohol license, we don't know if that just goes to another lot they own also. That's, that's not, they, they typically don't work in that fashion. They are, they are owned by a proprietor. Right, right. Um, and so in, in this case, it's the city who, the city, Blesses, if you will, location it has the power to, and so this city has exercised that discretion, and that is what this hearing is about. Okay. So, just for clarity on Vice Mayor Nagel's question, at 10 p.m., the opportunity you want to forward it is that the barbecue restaurant could reopen after Aqua Prime closes at 10 p.m. and stay open until two or whenever, whatever, whatever city court allows. And one other question, it's a COP for SRX. Yes. What is the distinction? Designation is in section 6 31 sub 10, and it's a consumption on premises only special restaurant. Thank you. There's a percentage that has to go to food, a percentage that has to go to alcohol. And I don't have the code handy. I'm sorry, that was. I, I have a question. Yes. Yes. Um, is there ever any regular reporting by holders of these? Licenses to confirm that they comply with those breakouts between food and beverage. Is there any way that that's enforced or reported to the city for informational purposes? Oh, I'm sorry, I didn't realize uh, that's an administrative um, process. Um, I, I'm not familiar with your question. Sorry, I'm sorry. I misdirected my question. I'm sorry. Yes, there's no. So it's there in code, but there's no follow up on it. Is there a code? There's no process set up for them to report. Okay, thank you. And anyone else have any questions? Shane, if you want to sit for a few minutes and then if someone wants to, I'm going to open the public hearing and anyone who would like to speak on this agenda item may come up at this time. Uh, my name is Lonnie Finn. I'm at 210 First Street. I've lived there for 19 years. This property is uh, adjacent to mine. Uh, my first concern is right here. Here's a letter from Mr. Crawford that's in the packet that states the barbecue will be open from 11 to 3, Aqua Prime will be open from 3 to 10, and then the barbecue will start again at 10 p.m. That's right there. He wrote that. He sent it in your packet. And then, it also says some live and pre-recorded music will be played out there. Well, I'm concerned about the noise. Like I say, it's just right up against my property. We already have uh, 10 o'clock, no noise outside. And after 7, the noise can be over 55 decibels. So, and on Sunday, can't go over 55. So me talking is probably <coughs> 60. 
So I don't know how they would meet that. And then I have to contend with people out there wandering around, throwing beer bottles over the fence, licking cigarette butts, the noise. I mean, I've lived there peacefully for 19 years, and now I've got to put up with this. I just ask that the commission be high. Thank you, Lonnie. You're welcome. <coughs> Down House 21 and 4 East Trump. Um, uh, applicant made use of a word that you never use except for you to describe how often you use it, and that's never. And they said this will never happen. It will happen. Something will happen. And then, um, I looked at uh, when I was looking through there. I, probably just a little point here, but the um, the, uh, the part that says it was contiguous, so that they they could actually be, uh, and haven't been involved in a couple of liquor licenses before, your ground is actually zoned also if you're going to take a drink out into it. So they have to, they have, to have that zone from the, from the state. Your liquor license has to include that, that area. And what their, the application that I saw did not have the thing from the city. Maybe it's just a point of order or, or there. It's in, things are going back and forth, but the packet that I looked at online did not have that filled out. Uh, the only way y'all can do this with a clean conscience is make sure they have enough parking to include these 40 extra seats. That's the only way y'all can do it. It will happen. There will be overlapping. The noise ordinance, yes, we have done. I'm sure he's concerned about the noise and all that. But y'all do have an ordinance for that to take care of that. Uh, but there are going to be, that, those two places are going to be open at the same time. And so if they can provide the extra parking for an, an additional 40 patrons, uh, I don't know if y'all have been down there, but parking's kind of tight. Okay, so uh, if they can, if they can afford, if they can find the parking for 40 additional patrons, which is what they say is going to be in that area, then y'all can comfortably do it. If not, I crazy to even touch this. Thanks. Thank you, Don. Is there anyone else who'd like to come forward at this time and speak on this agenda item? Uh, Matt Loder from Crabby Bills. <clears throat> you know, I uh, the uh, to answer. Commissioner Hoopenagel's uh, question, the, the state does check to make sure that you are at the 51% food uh, for, the, uh, for the license, for the state license. Uh, they don't check often enough, but, uh, but they're supposed to check, and so they check other things too, that you have enough pieces of soap water and all that, so that's all done by the state. And so if you don't meet that criteria, you wouldn't meet the city's criteria. Because you have, they have to, you have to have the city approval and the state approval. And the, the reason I'm here is because this is interesting to me because if this can happen where, like Mr. House just said, if you could use parking at, at different times, be able to say, okay, I'm adding this seating for parking that I don't have. I'm, I'm interested in doing the same thing. So whatever precedent is set here, I'd be interested. And that's why I'm here to go ahead and witness this because it might work to my advantage to be able to add more seating at different times as well. So I just think that's uh, something that's interesting to see how that works out. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Is there anyone else who would like to speak at this time on this agenda item? Okay, with that, I'm going to close Mayor, the uh, Yes, sir. Before we close the public comment, I've been asked to read into the record correspondence that was sent uh, from a Francis Comar and family of 209 Gulf Boulevard, Union Rocks Beach, Florida, 3375. Um, this, is in, this should be in your materials in the event it is not. It's being read in abundance caution. Indian Rocks Beach City Commission, this letter is being written in strong opposition to the proposed variance of aqua. Proposed variance of aqua prime request for a permanent extension to be approved for COP SRX alcoholic beverage use designation to extend its license to the newly acquired property located at 208 First Street. We do not want the proposed beer garden to be allowed behind our property. We have owned and lived at 209 Gulf Boulevard for over 16 years since 2002, which is the property directly behind 208 First. The reason for the strong opposition. To this proposed extension of their licenses, we do not wish the drunken, disorderly conduct, beer bottles, litter, loud music, and cigarettes with potential fire uh, at our front door. In parentheses, there was a fire at Aqua Prime a few months ago, close parentheses, at our front door. Our upstairs entrance is directly facing the proposed beer garden. We will not be able to use our outdoor balcony for our family. We will feel like prisoners in our own home. When we purchased our home, the property behind us, 208 First Street, was zoned for apartments. It was nice and peaceful, and we were good neighbors. Indian Rock Beach was a family oriented environment considered quaint town, quote unquote. The quaint feeling is the reason why Indian Rocks Beach has become so popular with tourists. Uh, let's keep higher media upscale and desired town it is. Sincerely, Francisco Martin family. Uh, that is the content of the letter. Uh, 
you submitted in your materials. Uh, that may or may close, move forward with closing. Okay. I have a question, Randy. That this makes reference to a variance. Uh, there's no variance, is that correct? Correct. This is not a variance request. Variances are for structure. This is not a structural variance. That's in the rep that's in the letter, but it's not correct. Correct. That, that letter is mistaken in that regard. Secondly, it says when we purchased our home, it was zoned for apartments. Has there been any zoning change that I'm not aware? Of? Uh, not in my tenure with your as your city attorney in the last five years. Um, that our firm had roughly five years. Our firm's been representing you. Um, I do not know the zoning history or when these people acquired title. If they acquired title. In <coughs> early 60s perhaps, but I, I don't know um, of any recent change to this stuff. Greg, I'm going to direct my question to you. Was there a zoning change? <laughs> Not since I've been here five and a half years. It's been zoned business that entire time. I also don't know the full history of if it was rezoned. There, you know, there obviously are people that live in the Triangle Business District, but the Triangle Business District is zoned business. It is zoned business. Yes. And it has been for quite some time. At least five and a half years. Thank you. Greg, the property, uh, Lonnie's property, that also, the whole thing over there is zoned business. Even, the, his, even though he's lived re residential for 19 years, that property is zoned business. That's correct. Okay. Anyone on the commission have any more questions for the applicant or for Gray or for the city attorney at this time? Um, with that staff and, and the and the applicant, are given the final opportunity to make a presentation there? Okay. So does the staff like the staff has nothing to add, Mayor? Okay. Is the applicant? Mr. Crawford, if you'd like to come forward and. And thank you, Madam Mayor, Commissioner. We took a look at that lot, and that lot was in pretty poor repair, if you want to call it that. We, it, it came for sale. We bought it not knowing what to do with it. Um, the cottage could not be saved. If it could have been, we would have taken a look at that. There's a couple of nice cottages, lines included, the one on the corner included. Um, I think a lot of this stems from a, a report that was given that we're going to build a hotel there. That's that's just not going to happen. This isn't about development tonight. This is about buying a lot next door and trying to clean it up and just make it part of our restaurant. Um, to what the gentleman said, I, again, when the when we open up at 11 o'clock in the morning, no one will be seated in the Aqua Prime restaurant as you know it today. It will only be the open lot. And then when that opens up at 3 o'clock, that shuts off and then the restaurant reopens. So. Again, we're not changing the traffic flow, the traffic count, the number of people there because we were always open for lunch at 11 o'clock and now we're <coughs> just going to move to the lot next door. So it's just a shift, just a, a change in our, our lunch crowd, a change in the, the, the type of food that we offer and, uh, and see if it works. If it works, it works. It, um, the other thing too that I wanted to bring up was there's 15 foot setbacks for each residential piece that's clearly earmarked with a 15 foot artificial turf. On, on Lonnie's side, and then on the, on the uh, um, I guess that would be the western side, the residential piece. So we know that we can't put anything permanent there. We, we want to abide by the rules. We just want to be good neighbors. We're just trying something different to see if it works, and just trying to clean up that piece of property that wasn't such a uh, wasn't so attractive next door to us at the same time. But that I can answer any any further questions. If it needs to be read into the record that Aqua Prime won't be open when this is open and vice versa, we're more than comfortable with that because that's exact that's the only way that we can function anyway to be honest with you. One of the biggest problems with this property and it has been even before you had it, but it has continued from time to time. I know as I know of as of last Saturday night the music was on till ten thirty at night. And you know, our, we've had problems with noise in the past. We've gotten much better. We tell all the residents that, to call the sheriff. Some have even called your place of business. And that's the biggest problem with granting this variance. All Mayor, it's not a variance, just speak. Um, excuse me. Um, the, extension the, of the, the, the extension of the liquor license. And so 
that is the biggest problem here, and that is why the people who are in the audience that are against it, it has to do with the noise. Understood. Understood. I, I'm unaware of any noise issues. I'm, I'm trapped out of corporate. I've never heard that. We've never received a noise ordinance or a violation, at least that I'm aware of, not even at least the phone call, to be honest with you. So if that's an issue, I can make sure that that's addressed. We, we want to want to play nice in the sandbox. We're not here to get <coughs> anybody. Just want to be another local restaurant that the locals and the, everybody else comes to. I can give out my <coughs> cell number if it gets loud at 10:30. We'll, we'll have it off. Absolutely. I'm looking for a motion. I just have some questions. Okay. Right. So, is there anything that prohibits Aqua Prime from? <laughs> in its existing license being open until 2 a.m.? No, Vice Mayor. As, uh, some, within the last year and a half to two years, this body considered an ordinance um, regarding the blue laws, and you, you recall that discussion. Um, the, city, the city opted to extend its hours but not make them <coughs> coextensive with the county maximum of 3 a.m. I believe, if memory serves, that we agreed on 1 a.m. within this town to maybe more restrictive. I worked on a few of those. Um, but I do know that we, we are not coincidence with the county's outside limit. Um, they are a business like any other, and their application seeks to um, enjoy the ordinary restrictions of ours, um, as I understand. So nothing in the code, to answer your question narrowly, no, nothing in the code prevents. So we're not approving anything here that's going to let them all of a sudden be open later than they were. No, uh, we are not. This is a function of how they are opting to manage their business relative to those restrictions. What they, what they, what the applicant has proposed is to pivot its operation from one portion of its of the structures to another, um, yeah. a more a smaller for, version during certain hours. So we would only be extending which lot it operates on. All right. So if they were to decide to have this some big door that closes off the restaurant and just open up their existing patio until 2 a.m they wouldn't need to come here and get an approval. I'm not sure that I understand the construct of the door you're discussing. If, 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 but if, pres if presently they said, on the lots that we have an alcohol license that we already operate, we have decided, business decision, it's more profitable for us to stay open another two to three hours within whatever the limits of the town are, there's nothing that presently prevents them from doing so. So all we're doing is making that a little bit bigger. We're not changing the nature of what they do or could do. We're just making the lines a little bigger. As I understand it, yes. So the noise issue is no different. It's just it's just a bigger square. Mm -hmm. Correct. It's one more lot, but that but that, that, that concern is relative. Right. Right. But it's right. and then as one member of the public aptly noted, we do have noise restrictions. If there are calls, um, they are handled as all ordinance violations are, and you know see the discussion short term. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I think I have no more questions. Does anyone else have any questions? I, I just wonder, you know, why set up a, another lot where the people are going to have to go into the restaurant anyways to use the bathrooms, as you're stating in here, when you can't just open up your present patio you have, then you're not putting it right behind someone's house or right next to someone's house. Because you say you have the buffers there with the turf and all that. But people are going to wander over, they're going to hang out, they're going to do all that. So I don't know why you just don't do it to where you have a nice outdoor sitting area already. Uh, a simple answer. A, when we bought the property, we had no idea that there was going to be 15-foot setbacks on both sides. We originally bought it to make it a parking lot. And so when you have 15-foot setbacks on what would be the northern and western side, you need to stack like six, seven cars in there, maybe tops. So then we came up with this idea, it, it's a <coughs> passion, if you will, of my CEO that just wanted to do two completely different genres of food within the same day. And uh, we, we started doing that, we actually own a business in the Virgin Islands and we're modeling it after that, so it's just two completely different ideas. It's like the new wave of uh, sushi and sports bar combined, you know, no one would have thought 10 years ago you'd ever see that, you see that all over the place today, this is going to be fine dining, and during the afternoon you can grab yourself a barbecue sandwich and a tap beer. So the short answer is we ran out of things to use that lot. So and then it, even if it was a parking lot, it has to have those 15 foot setbacks all the way around? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. <coughs> I think 
any other questions of the applicant at this time? Mary, you can close the hearing. Okay, I'll close the hearing. Thank you very much. Good discussion. We can discuss more. Or is there anyone who? Is I, did, I had too many gray areas for me. You know, with the parking, with the can have it open afterwards, and you know, the, you, where are you serving drinks from, or going in the restaurant as it is to use the bathrooms, what's going to prevent them from starting. You know, I just, yeah, too many gray areas for me. Sorry. Sorry. Looking for a motion. A motion with stipulations. I don't just. I think I. establishment 
user using Fabio, which is already able to do that. Well, you just set up a ten o'clock. I know. I'm saying ten o'clock is then ten o'clock in the that new area, the potential area that can cause disruption. You're saying ten o'clock to the outside area? No, to the, the to the, to the extension the area. Park. Yeah. The application, the application, and the considerations before this body are limited to the what has been described in your discussion as the new area, the extension. The extended area, the, extended area, the 208 First Street area, is the only area under consideration. We are not generally for the license. Do you want something in there that they can't be open at the same time? Yeah. I'm not sure. That that is well, covered in part law. It's covered in part. That's a zoning issue, or is that a? That's not an alcohol license issue. That's a code enforcement issue, right? Well, probably with not being a bad thing. Yeah, that's the reason. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 Yeah.
start on 8A, work session item, discussion of Golf Boulevard, pedestrian bicycle safety study. Can I give you a copy of the questions. 
And then what I would recommend to you is that, that we would place back on the agenda in April uh, the final, you know, it's an agenda item, the final discussion of what you like, what you don't like, and that kind of thing. And one other clarification about the narrowing of lanes, because I was interested in this also, is if, if the commission has any thoughts one way or the other about that, or if the county decides to implement the, the lane changes in the, the additional space for the, uh, the bicycle, bicycle path, um, it would be five to six years before that would ever happen because they're not going to do that until they resurface and they just resurface uh, since I've been here. So it's a workshop, no final decisions. We'll put it back on the, the, uh, uh, on the agenda in April. They're presenting a, a, an updated pedestrian study based on the commission's request to do that. And we just really appreciate the county to be here to, to walk us through this. So I'll turn it over to you. Thank you. Thank you for having us. My name is Joan Rice, and I'm going to be presenting the Gulf Boulevard Pedestrian Bicycle Safety Study. I work for Pinellas County Public Works Department, Transportation. Also with me tonight is Tom Washburn working for the county, and also uh, Whit Blanton and Rodney Chapman are here from Fort Worth Pinellas. So if you have um, questions that I can't answer, hopefully one of them will be able to answer for you. If you could go to the next slide, please. Okay. The, uh, the study was completed um, from Walsingham Road all the way to Sand Key Bridge. And the study was completed in August of 2018. It was a follow-up study to the 2013 study that put in the um, crosswalks that we have today. This study was a re-evaluation of the corridor, see what works, what doesn't work. And it was also a study to look at the consistency between the county and the state sections. The um, state section of Gulf Boulevard is from Walsingham South, and from Walsingham North is the county section. Next slide, please. Gulf Boulevard, um, we presented this in October, as the um, city manager said. Our consultant was speaking for us. Tonight's presentation is gonna be an inter uh, overview for just the Indian Rocks Beach section. We'll discuss the recommendations, costs, funding, and even some schedule. Next slide. The study included some data collection, included the pedestrian bicycle volume counts, crash analysis, field observations, but it also followed um, pedestrian and bicycle <coughs> facility manual rules, including the Florida Department of Transportation Traffic Engineering Manual, the Florida Design Manual, as well as the Manual on Uniform Traffic the recommendations for the full study included new and or removing existing crosswalks, talked about side street high emphasis crosswalk striping, that's the pavement marking that looks like a ladder on the road. It also talked about the modifying the existing lane widths so that the bike lanes would be a standard width. And it also talked about installing green bike, line, <coughs> bike lanes along the corridor. This would not happen within Indian Rocks Beach. Um, it's only in conflict areas, like where the right turn is. Uh, you see them at, a, at a more of the signalized intersections. Next, please. So just for Indian Rocks Beach, Walsingham to 28th Avenue, the speed limit is 30 miles per hour. There's 18,000 vehicles per day. In the five years of crash data between 2013 and 2017, there were three pedestrian and 11 bicycle crashes. The heaviest crash, crash crossing areas are the intersections of Walsingham Road, 7th Avenue, 8th Avenue, and also the corridors between 9th Avenue to 18th and 24th to 28th. Next please. Now we're gonna go through all of the crosswalks. We're gonna look at all the crosswalks that are existing, all those that were proposed to be added and those that were supposed to be removed. Um, and we can have a more in-depth conversation about each one if you would like. Um, after this, I did bring some more slides for um, aerials if you wanted to see any of them. And you can pick and choose between what you like, what you don't like. Ultimately, we would like to have your opinion on where you would like to see these. 
and then we would get into more depth of, of the exact which side of the road and what other features would be added. The boxes that you see underneath the different locations, those are the amount of crossings that were done from the peak hour during the data collection. I pulled the um, slide from, from the report, so I, I didn't um, remove any data that was already in the report. But the existing crosswalk south of 7th Avenue would remain. However, the um, one between 8th and 9th Avenue would be removed, and the new one would be placed closer to 8th Avenue. Next, please. The crosswalk north of 9th would remain, but then we would also add one at 10th Avenue, 12th Avenue, and 15th Avenue. The existing crosswalk between 11th and 12th Avenue would be removed. Next, please. Okay. Then, um, there would be a new one located at 16th Avenue, and the ones between 17th and 18th, and between 20th and 21st would remain. Next. We would add one at 23rd, at 24th, remove the one between 25th and 26th, add one at 26th, and then the one at 28th would remain. <coughs> so let's talk about cost now. In order to remove the existing crosswalks, there were three that we that we showed. Um, the funding sources would be from the county to remove the pedestrian features and the median opening. To reduce the cost, the median, median itself would remain, would remove just that por portion that somebody would be crossing across. Next. We are the study recommended the installation of the eight new crosswalks. Each cross crosswalk costs approximately $86,000. Funding, we would look to the Florida Department of Transportation to um, provide us with the rectangular rapid flashing beacons, just like that you have with the existing ones you have. The county would be responsible for putting in the raised median islands, the curb ramps, and all of the signage. However, if the city would like to have any additional landscaping, irrigation, lighting, or decorative pavement, that would be something that we would have to coordinate with you and is not included in the $86,000. Next, please. Okay, the second recommendation was the ins installation of the 21 side street high emphasis crosswalk striping. Um, the picture below shows what that would look like. It's used mainly so that the um, vehicle that is turning off of Gulf Boulevard onto the side street would realize that they are passing in a zone that pedestrians may be located. The cost for each one of these is $900 a piece, and that would be something the county um, would, would put in, and we're actually concerned putting that in right now. Next slide. So, um, oh, I'm sorry. The third recommendation was modifying the 1.8 miles of existing lanes um, to, so that you would have a standard bike lane width. The cost is $140,000 per mile. Um, that would also include reducing the size of, of all of those eight medians at a cost of $12,000 each because the existing median of 13 feet, we would need to come up with the additional footage for the bike lane from the lane as well as from the median. This is something that the county would consider during its next resurfacing cycle. And as the city manager says, it's not even in our next five year plan to be resurfacing this roadway. Um, so at this time, this is not something that we're looking at doing anytime soon. Okay, next, please. So a cost summary for all the ones that I've just talked about includes removing of three of the crosswalks, installing eight crosswalks, the 21 size street crosswalks, the 1.8 miles of travel lane width um, changing, including the eight median modification, would be a total of $1.1 million. Now, all of these things may not be that. It's a coordination effort that we need to do with you to decide what we would all like to have. Next slide, please. One additional recommendation that came 
from the report was an installation of wayfinding signs and pavement markings. And this is to have signage a block or two away from Gulf Boulevard on the city streets that would instruct the pedestrians where the nearest crosswalk is going to be. This is something that's not in the county right away, so um, funding would be on the city for design installation. The sample that's on the side is, is that it's, it's just a, a sample, an example. You can do it however you would like and however fancy as you would like to have as well. Next slide, please. So the schedule. A lot of these items are short term and long term. So the side streets, we can add that, you know, in the next year or so. The long term items, like the resurfacing of the road, that's something that's going to be a ways away. Coordination, we would definitely need to coordinate with, with you and city staff for the specific locations. And um, we know that some of the locations may have to be shifted slightly because of driveways and also because of drainage structures. So that is something that would end up coming through in design. Uh, funding, that we would first look to the Department of Transportation to see if we can get the RRFBs, any kind of safety funding. Um, and then finally, it would go into construction. That's the end of my presentation, unless you want to look at any of the location specific ones. Okay. Okay. Do any of the commissioners have any questions? For We're going to have a workshop about it, right? Yes. Thank you for the Thank you. Nick? Bill, would you like to ask any questions of Joe? The biggest concern that I've heard, and I think it's a, it's a one of safety, I think you answered this a little bit in here, we're actually to get the additional uh, roadway that you need, you're, you're to put the bike lanes in, for example, you're talking about narrowing the islands, is that correct? Is that where part of it will come from? Part of it, you are correct. Uh, in order to get the extra two feet necessary for each bike lane, because right now the, the, the area is, not, is, is only three foot wide now. Standard bike lane is five, okay, so we need two extra feet. Um, we have to get that somewhere between the two curbs and it would come from the lane and, the, or, and or from the median. So we would have to look at where we would grab that. The illustration that's in the report shows that the lane widths would be shrunk down to 10, and then the median would be shrunk down to 11 feet. But it could be um, any number of uh, different amounts. Biggest concern that, that we have heard is that Gulf Boulevard is kind of narrow to begin with, and the cars and the trucks are bigger. And we're very concerned, at least the people I've heard from and talk with are concerned. If it gets smaller now, what happens? Okay. So just for your... She was fine. Thank you, thank you. And, and do you know that um, this would not come up until the next resurfacing? Um, and at that time, we would have to um, address any of the current standards of that time, and we would have to make adjust, adjust, uh, adjustments. Appreciate it. Thank you. No. I just, I just, I can't see narrowing Gulf Boulevard at all and increasing a, a bike lane to five lanes, because right now, in the morning, they're riding three to four abreast, and they're in the lane as it is. You make that lane bigger, you're going to have them riding five and six. And anybody that drives Gulf Boulevard in the morning that's sitting here shaking their heads, we all know what happens. And I think making it, I mean, it's bad enough driving between December and May on Gulf Boulevard as it is with people that don't know where they're going. They're riding in the bike lane. I ride my bike to work. I refuse to ride in the street unless there is someone on the sidewalk, I'll go around them and then get right back on the sidewalk because there's too many black marks on the curb. Thank you. Well, would the um, county ever make the bike lane substandard, like four feet instead of five feet? Is there any wiggle room there or is it, is it is either what it is or the standard? Is there any? Well, I mean, the county would look at whatever things that can't, could be done. One item that could be done is the lane could be removed and then sharrows could be put down. Sharrows are what you see um, further south on, on Gulf Boulevard um, because bicycles are allowed to be in the travel lane. 
Cheryl was like that picture of the it's bike. The picture of the bike with the little sergeants on top, the yeah. sergeant symbol on top, that's a Cheryl, so that um, is to inform the motorist that the bicyclist is allowed to be there. And that's, they're allowed to be there. So there's, there's different options it could be. It might not be a, a smaller lane. It may be a Shero instead. Or it could be something else that's come up by the time um, our resourcing project comes. And I think it's great to do the um, get rid of the mid-block crosswalks because no one uses those. They're, they're really not useful at all. Um, I understand what you're saying. You leave them in there as medians. That was done south of 7th Avenue when the 7th Avenue crosswalk was moved north uh, a few hundred feet. And it's, as a result of that median still being there, it's created a shorter turn lane mm -hmm. for turning left up Walton here, mm -hmm. um, which has backed up a lot of traffic. So it may not always be a great idea to leave the medians there. Um, then the other question I had was if you do the um, crosswalks with the $86,000 ones, you don't have to do that, right? You could just put the lines on there and it'd be 900 bucks or 4000 if you did all four corners, right? There, there are different options we can we can look into. <coughs> of course, we like to see the, the median of pedestrian refuge in the center, um, but there is a crosswalk just to the north of, of the city that does not have a pedestrian yeah. refuge area. Um, the volume of traffic on the roadways and the Florida um, Federal Highway Administration suggests with that type of volume of traffic, you would have a pedestrian refuge. Okay, so it's, is it mandated or is it suggested? It's, well, it's a guideline, okay. um, but it's, every location has to be engineered. So it, it may mean that we have to shift to a different location or um, we have to work with what we have. So when you put those refuges close to the intersections, it gets kind of hard if it's got a physical barrier, it's kind of hard to make a left or right turn. Correct. The the barrier would have to be back at least 50 feet to allow one car to be in there. Um, but we like the what the report found was that the crossing, the pedestrians that are crossing now like to be crossing closer to the intersection and not having to walk half a block up and then walk back yeah. to a beach access. So we, we want to make it. Um, Nice for everybody, the motor vehicles as well as the pedestrians, so we will work with you. Yeah, it might be safer for everyone, especially traffic flow, to just do the painted ones because that way you don't block the, the turn traffic, which ends up backing up the whole Gulf Boulevard because you know, people stop and wait. Yes. The only thing with um, not putting in that island in the center means that we don't have the opportunity to put that additional or RFB in the center so that you've got the blinking lights in both directions. You would have the RRFBs just on either side, but they would be on both sides so that you would have that recognition on both sides of the street. I think they have that on West Bay, I think, because you the one is heading west on West Bay coming over the bridge. There's one of those. It's very visible. Even though there's not a median, it's very visible to the driver. Thank you. So you, you mentioned the um, high emphasis crosswalk stripping, uh, striping. Is that something you said it, something you're interested in doing even sooner? I think that would be a great idea to get started right away because people pull out into the streets without even stopping at stop signs at this point. That is something that we're looking at doing um, soon. Tom, do you have a, um, anything else to add for that? Hi, I'm Tom Washburn with the Pinellas County. Um, yeah, the side street crosswalks, you know, John mentioned earlier that part of this study was to try, try to be more consistent with the DOT does. In the last couple of years, the DOT went to a policy where they, they striped the side streets with the crosswalks. Um, we've got a striping crew in-house, so with, with the city's approval, if that's what they want to do, um, you know, that's something we can do rather than short order. Thank just the one thing we're talking about the islands or the refuges or whatever the the complaint i've heard is you cannot see the people standing there with the trees and that that's a big issue where you know aesthetically it's nice seeing trees in the middle of the street but 
it's it's not safe for visibility. And so you definitely need to be able to see the pedestrian that's out there. You don't want to have to right. step out behind right. a tree. People don't even see the lights flashing, let alone someone behind a tree. So, so another question: If they're leave, if we're going to leave crosswalks where they are at today and not remove them or do something with them, what happens to the maintenance of those? Is you know over time, if we had a mid block today and we're just going to leave it, is that something we're going to maintain long term? Is that our responsibility? I, I believe the landscaping is, is your responsibility, correct? Yeah, landscaping. we have lights. Everything. The, the, the current budget that we're in right now is part of the contract that we have with the outside firm that make, where they maintain the beach entrances. They also are responsible for maintaining the islands there on along the Gulf Road. So that's our responsibility. Joan, I'm going to have you take a seat for a few minutes and. We are going to workshop this at a later date, but because there are so many people there tonight, I think there are some who would like to say, um, voice their opinion. So I'm going to let them come up tonight. Just with... yes, clarify sir. that. This is the workshop. The next time this will appear, appear in April, will be an agenda for you to take right, action. Right, right, okay. right. So if you'd like to come forward at this time. My name is Barry Eagle. I live at 2200 Gulf Boulevard, Unit 203. <clears throat> I'm a citizen of both Indian Rocks Beach and Pinellas County. And I know this commission listens to the citizens when they speak. I only hope Pinellas does as well. Uh, I wish I brought a pen tonight because there are so many comments I want to make. Number one, the statistics showed that there were four bicycle accidents per year. If any of those were fatal, I'm sure that would have been included there. So, when I get to the bike lane, please remember that. <clears throat> as far as the crosswalks, everyone knows that no one will walk a half a block, let alone two blocks, to make a crossing to the beach access. So, if we can put more crosswalks on streets that have beach access and remove all of those ones in the middle, that would be great. If we leave those <coughs> islands, they are very dangerous. There was a woman who was killed on Gulf Boulevard uh, in San Key because the driver could not see her in that island because of the trees. And those lights flash for a long period of time. And as a driver, you look and you slow down. And if you see someone just leaving it, you, you do not stop fully for the full time that that light is flashing. And that's what happened to this lady. So I think those trees are crazy. I don't like the safety. I think the double flashing lights with a clear striping would be sufficient. As far as the bike lanes are concerned, it's already been mentioned by Mr. Hanna. The lanes are too narrow now. Trucks are getting bigger. Cars and SUVs are getting bigger. And to increase lanes for bicycles, where if they're doing what they're supposed to be doing, and that's driving in single file, the three feet that are there plus the extra room that the car is supposed to give them should be sufficient. Widening them to five feet would only encourage them to drive two abreast or more on cycles <coughs> and impede traffic flow. So I think if we're looking at people who are using the beach, people who are living in the city, people who are driving here, that should be our focus, not someone who wants to use our two miles of traffic as part of their 25 mile drive. Thank you. Lord of Arcy, 708 Beach Trail. Phil, I think, is the only guy that rides his bike to work in, in uh, Indian Rocks Beach. Uh, I have a couple questions. Number one, how many cars are there versus bicycles? I'm all for safety and, and all that, and I don't want to see anybody get hurt or anything on, on a bicycle or in a car or a pedestrian. The issue is Gulf Boulevard is already a substandard road. Okay. Uh, we didn't ask the county that, but I would ask that question. It already is a substandard road. It's too narrow. Okay, if you're going to put in, uh, if you're going to add another two feet or close, close it up, you know, as the gentleman said before me, cars get bigger, so are buses and everything else. I think it would be a ridiculous thing. In addition, I would ask the police because they do do tickets <laughs> for automobiles every Saturday and every Sunday. There's there's a bunch of bicycle guys. They don't live here. 
they live someplace in Madeira or up in San Key, but they, they fly down Gulf Boulevard, they don't fly, they do 20 miles an hour, they, they hold up traffic. Why can't they be arrested or have tickets? Uh, I, don't think that, I don't think the police are doing their job on that. I, I, and I've asked that question before. I was told by the police, well, they see us, so they, you know, they, they avoid us. They hide for cars. They can also hide for bicycles. Thank you. Hi, Bob Linderman, 455 20th Avenue. Um, so, uh, first of all, I agree with um, Phil Robel and the other comments about the uh, what they call the refuge or whatever it was referred to in the study. Those things are not refuges. Those, it's really hard to see people behind them in many cases, and sometimes even a light, they'll stop or something, and then the lights go off, and you got somebody in the middle. So I've seen actually people get into close scrapes, so I would say that we really need to do something about that. Second thing, I think the bike lane, or is this right, it's too abreast, what is the state law? Uh, this guy's um, Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I believe that it's two abreast is the law, not one abreast. Is that right? So we do need, we probably do need some, um, we do need to get some consideration. Even the three feet is pretty close. I've been, I've ridden my bike up and down to Sand Key, and um, and it's, it, you get, some of the cars get pretty close, and they're not wider than any car. They're just, they're not paying attention, or they just feel like, you know, they're going to use up as much of the road. Uh, so, uh, one of the things that I think as a commission that you guys should probably do is think about this in the overall parking issue that we have, especially during the season where people park up and down our streets and then they just cross from wherever they're parked, they just cross the street. They don't go to any crosswalk, they just, wherever, they kind of wait for traffic and then they, they kind of go out there. So, there's another uh, consideration in that regard. I do think that, um, the uh, narrowness of the planes are something to really be considered, so we're going to have to really figure out if we're going to give more uh, leeway to bikers, we have to, uh, we're, we're going to have to figure out a way to get narrower things. The last thing I would say was I think this is way too many crosswalks for a short period of time. It is so bad getting up and down Golf Boulevard, especially during the season. But if we have, I don't know what the number is, but we're netting about five more, five additional crosswalks, there's always going to be some lights blinking. Nobody's ever going to get through this town. So I think some consideration ought to be given that strategically where do we place them, where we get the most traffic, as opposed to just adding a bunch of crosswalks. Um, and then there was one other point that I had, which is, uh, forgot so uh, anyway, so those are those are the things that that uh, I think sh the commission should be thinking about as we go through this workshop and then continue. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry Newton, uh, 438 Harvard Drive. A um, couple of points, you know, I definitely agree with the uh, the fact that bicycles already ride multiple abreast. Yeah. Um, obviously, with very little, if any, regard for traffic, uh, especially on the weekends, um, but if you get caught behind them, you either have to go through the center or somehow find a way to get around them or go 15 to 18 miles an hour for several miles. Um, there's no, you know, I would rather have the existing laws enforced and make them go in the <coughs> designated area than I would to give them more area, which encourages them to be more abreast. And my second point would be, um, I don't know this for a fact, but I'm going to make a suggestion, maybe we could find out. Uh, I doubt if most of our accidents happen at the cross rocks. Uh, what I think is dangerous is the intersections. When you're pulling out onto Gulf Boulevard, in a lot of those streets, you have to pull a little bit far forward to even see traffic. And when you're there, you're in the bike lane, or darn close to it. So I think, this, I think the, uh, the just generally driving in our city, 
um, it's kind of dangerous that way and that those markings for the bike lane as they cross the uh, intersections I think are a great idea. Maybe that would help a little bit. But you still have that problem. As a biker, I don't think that would be a very relaxing to have people pulling out potentially in front of you at every block. So anyway, my third point, um, as a retailer, I see delivery trucks in that center lane all the time. Food trucks, furniture delivery trucks, every kind of truck that has business in either the condos or the restaurants. And that lane's already narrow enough. The center lane, I think, is, I, I'm sorry, I don't know the number right now, the width of the center lane is, anybody, 12, 13? 13. Okay, um, to narrow that is a really bad idea. Uh, you have people working out of the tailgated trucks, getting in and out of delivery trucks. Uh, all your food services, like I said, are there on a regular basis. And anything that would take uh, safety away from that lane, I think, would result in more injuries than the rest of the conversation we're having here. Yeah. So, those are my points. Thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Good evening. Darlene Cavanaugh, 361 Mel, Dr. Beller Bus, but also part-time at uh, 450 Harbor Drive South with my family, like I said. Also speaking on behalf of my family on this subject. I'm also an owner of a fifth wheel and dually truck. The lanes are um, very narrow as they are. This is a boating community also, so people have large boats. Um, traffic is already slow as it is. I think this move would only slow traffic down as it is uh, already is. This is also an evacuation route. People need to be able to get through in a timely manner and safely. If they um, make the lanes any smaller, there'd be no room for error. What if you have a tire blowout? Where are you going to go if there's going to be a bike right next to you? Um, let's see. We already have a bike and sidewalk in place. Also, uh, like when I grew up here, we always rode on the side streets in the back. We didn't go on the main road. I know it doesn't go all the way through, but um, most bikers go, people traveling on their bikes go on the side, side streets. Um, doing so, making lanes smaller, will force traffic into our residential neighborhoods. I don't know if that has been looked at. They, a similar thing happened in Los Angeles, where I was actually born, in Santa Monica, California, in their beach community, where they wanted to slow down traffic, and they made the lanes smaller. Well, the residents got together, this was on NBC News, and they sued. And because it was forcing traffic from the main roads into the residential streets, because people were so fed up of stopping in, on the main road that they were cutting through all the other new roads to get through. So think about that. I don't know if the county looks at that. Um, I don't know if you guys are already aware, but Bel Air Bluffs will be um, cutting down on the West Bay Road project. And I'm only mentioning that because if you think it's already hard to get through here, it's going to be even harder. So I'm just throwing that out there. Um, Also, please consider the increase of the population and condos, how much they're going up every day with the population growth in Florida in, in general. Um, and that's all. Thank you. Randy Briggs, 46620. Um, I, I came early so that I could have a conversation with the Sheriff's Department because I think they could share some numbers with us on pedestrians. Um, first of all, jaywalking is a violation. Um, so, from the Sheriff's Department, I'd like to see a report of actual <coughs> warnings, and citations. Maybe education could be part of the problem here, too, as well. Thanks. Anyone else wishing to speak on this agenda item? Please come forward at this time. Good evening. Uh, Bert Valerie, uh, 447 18th Avenue. Um, if I understand this right, there's uh, three parts to your uh, presentation. The uh, painted crosswalks go in a continuation of the sidewalks across the street. 
then the uh, crosswalks have crossed the over, and then the bike lane width. Uh, if I understand from Greg, the bike lane that can't be done for five years. Is that right? Yes. So what could could we possibly split this discussion up? Where it seemed like 90% of your presentation, folks were talking about the bike lane, the width of the bike lane, the width of the road, the width of the center median, and that's not going to be happening for five years. Whereas we have a pedestrian problem right now. People trying to cross the street, just cross the damn street, and I'd like to see us resolve that. And I think we definitely do have an issue there. I mean, Florida still leads the. Uh, I'm sorry, Pinellas County still leads the state in bicycle and pet uh, accidents and fatalities, and the state still leads the nation in both of those. So these are definite issues. It's something that we need to be looking at. Um, but since we're not going to have the, the bike lane issue resolved for another five years, and we already said they could start painting this year for the lanes, I'd like to see us break this up and make a decision or our discussion focusing on what's going to happen in the next few years, and then we can talk about the other later on. Is that something we could do? Okay, all right, well, with that in mind then, um, first of all, you guys did a great uh, job there. I think the survey was really in inclusive, and they came up with a bunch, bunch of good recommendations. Um, I have never, um, I formed the Bicycle Advisory Committee 30 years ago, I've been on it ever since, and, meeting with these, these guys all the time. They're a great group of people dedicated to their job. They really know their stuff. Um, but I don't agree with everything necessarily. Uh, you know, we have a group of maybe 30 people at these meetings. And uh, you, you've been to some of them cooking. And uh, you have different ideas. I'm not an advocate of, this, of these median, the center um, cross, crosswalk median things. Like other folks have said, they're very hard at night to see people crossing in them. They get in them and the lights are blinking. You can't tell them. They just disappear on them. We also put those medians in first as traffic commerce, not as crosswalks. And it did work well. It's, it may be cars think that the road was narrow, or it wasn't, but cars slowed down. And you know, it may be nice to have cars moving along at 30 miles an hour, but a lot of times they're moving at 40 and 50 on Gulf World War II. So you know, it did, it did the job. But then we turned them into crosswalks. And uh, we, just as you've heard a lot of people here say already, it's human nature, you get to your avenue, you walk down your avenue, you've gotten to Gulf Boulevard, your goal is right across the street, that's what you're going to do, you're going to cross right there at the street. And we've seen that it only costs like $900 to put in the painted mediums. I really would like to see us have a lot more painted mediums, or painted crosswalks just going across Gulf Boulevard from the avenue <coughs> that want it, that have enough traffic to warrant it. Those are very cheap, and yet they work all of the United States, and cars all of the United States recognize that they're going to be there. And to address Bob's one issue of all this is going to slow down traffic. Comments. Okay, all this is going to slow down traffic. You're going to have the same number of people at the crossings, crossing, regardless of what you do. And we have the same number of people who cross, whether there's a legitimate crosswalk there, whether there's a blinky light there, or whether there's nothing there. The same number of people will be crossing. So the same number of cars will come to a stop. It's not going to increase or slow down traffic. OK, if you would consider, please, the idea of splitting this up, though, so we can accomplish something that will happen. Thank you. Sir, if anyone else wishing to speak on this agenda item, please come forward. Hello again. John Fansteel, 448, Cover Drive South. I would like to talk about the lane narrowing. So far, I've heard everybody who's talked about it said they're against it. I think it would be great for the commission to put a very clear message to forward the analysis that we don't want narrowing of the traffic lane in Indian Rocks Beach. We should also be aware that the goal, the stated goal according to the presentation, I guess it was October, uh, is to slow traffic on Gulf Boulevard. Was there a figure of 18,000? vehicles per year, figure 1.6 on average per vehicle. That's a little more where SUVs. That's about 30,000 people a day, excuse me, that goes down the Gulf Boulevard. Do we want to slow those people down? It just, this, this seems crazy. It seems like the um, tail shaking the uh, dog. Um, and the last thing is, on a 10-foot narrow travel lane, FDOT's recommendation for tra transit lanes is 11 feet, so they're narrowing it below what FDOT is. Um, 
There are many vehicles whose mirrors are 10 foot wide. There are some vehicles whose mirrors are over 10 foot wide. So this just makes some sense. So I hope the commission comes through a very clear position on that. Uh, add in other people's ideas about getting rid of the raised Portions in the middle is great because they also recommend that you move over three feet. If you don't have those concrete barriers, people can move over three feet and get into the trees and read all of that. So I think you have some wonderful ideas here, but I hope you come to a clear consensus that Indian Rock Speech doesn't want them to narrow the traffic lanes to 10 feet. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who would like to speak on this agenda? Peter Samson, 1206. Um, I'm a cyclist. I just want to put a word in for cyclists. Uh, I find those peloton groups on the weekends annoying as well. They zoom by, but uh, you have to find a way to accommodate that. And then, not only that, we have the, the regular seasonals and other folks who ride their beach bikes. They'll rent them at the bike shop on 13th there, and Phil and other folks who just do it out for recreation and, and, and that. So I wouldn't, I think part of that should be, uh, part of the plan should also be uh, educating motorists, and share the road, not being annoyed. Uh, uh, that's part of living in the beach community, education about sharing the road with cyclists uh, should be part of that. I'm not necessarily for uh, expanding the lanes to five feet. They're sufficient. I've had some close calls as careful as I am. But I just want to put in work for the cyclists. You know, some of them do try to do the right thing, put lights on their bikes, uh, and, and it's the Peloton groups. Uh, I don't know how you kind of kind of work with them. That really, uh, and but they they do ride on the weekends on some early Sunday morning. So there's some amelioration of that. That as, as annoying as they are, they're on weekends in low traffic areas. But give a break to cyclists and include them in your, in your deliberation. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak on this agenda item before we close? Okay, Bob. widen the road to four lanes or something like that. If you go south where they've done all that in Reddington and all that sort of stuff, they have 30 and 35 mile an hour speed limits through there. First of all, it looks like an industrial highway. And secondly, nobody, I mean nobody, pays any attention. So you have people really zooming through. So again, I don't know what influence we can have on the county in that regard, but the last thing that I would just say is if in any way at some point we decide well we just don't have enough room we have to widen everything and we widen the road to include another lane i think that would be really a huge mistake or something but um if that's even a consideration but i'm concerned about it thank you thank you anyone else would like to speak okay with that we'll close the public hearing and is there any more discussion on this agenda uh, discussion on we're, we're definitely going to have a meeting on this. We want to give consensus to staff about anything. some of the items. Where, where would you like us to go with this now, Greg? <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Let's go. Uh, what I would suggest that we do is that we, that we place this on the April City Commission meeting. And clearly, it's like Mark said, there's three different elements. There's the side crosswalks where the county will strike the on strike. And I don't think I've heard anybody that thinks that's not a bad idea. Yeah, so you list that as one, you list one, the pedestrian crossings. Y'all have got the up-to-date information that makes the eight recommendations. You've heard good information tonight about whether we need items or we don't. So that's the second thing that would be listed in that discussion. And the third is the bike lanes. And the good news about the bike lanes, you've already heard from the county that that's not something they're going to do 
immediately anyway. So I think that's the way to deal with it is we can put it on the agenda, list those things separately under this study, and that way y'all can tick them off um, whether what your what the consensus is at the April meeting and that gives a full vetting, it gives people time to talk about this in the community, talk to y'all about it. And then at that point in April you, you click those three topics, make your decision and you'll be done with this for a period of time. I think that sounds reasonable. Is everybody okay with that? Yeah. Okay. We have the three distinct categories that we're going to list. Side, side crosswalks, pedestrian cross, crossings, and bike, and bike lanes. But we don't, and one thing I would like the commission is of the eight, the ones that they, that they do feel that we need them, and also the ones that have been taken away. You know, in the, in the uh, study, I'd like them to evaluate which ones in that, that they would like to have any more. And with that, yes. Can we can we put on there also that we remove the trees out of the islands and lower the shrubs? I mean, we have plenty of places we can plant those trees in the city. I mean, yeah, yeah during, during that that meeting, that would be the perfect time to make a decision about the future of the islands, whether you're going to be gone completely and you're going to go with. Just the striping, or if you're going to take the trees out and leave the shrubs, you can make all that decision at the same time, and then we'll we'll act on that. To the part of the crosswalk discussion, we should put that in. Well, and and also I don't know if we because I know there are some areas that do not have crosswalks in reasonable areas that I think the white stripes would help out. Absolutely. Um, you know, I don't know if you want to look at this. Remember, the only thing I'm kind of like about that is. You know, the, the county hired a consulting firm to look at the stretch of Gut Boulevard. Anywhere that you put, you know, I want to make sure you all understand this, anywhere that you put the stripes across the road, you have to put in the flashing beacons. And so if you add, just say you want to add, add two more, three more, you can do the math of what it's going to cost the county and the city for, the, for a location that this, if you want to add one here, there's, there's a there's a dollar sign associated with that. And versus the county, if you if your if your recommendation to the county is that, that you want to add three more than what they're recommending or change them up, they're going to have to agree to it because the county's going to absorb the cost to add additional crosswalks because you just can't paint them. You got to put the signs up. You got to put the flashing beacons up. You got to do the whole thing. So about eighty nine thousand dollars for. No, I think I think what we're saying is you can do that without the, the median, the refuge, right? right? There's a cost with the refuge and a cost without the refuge. Right. So I I think we're having a consensus that we don't necessarily want more refuge. I think that's a clear consensus. Yes. That because I'm going to ask why you're here. What's to, to uh, properly sign and the signage and the flashing beacons, what's, what's the approximate cost per location to propose that? I've seen that number it's before. A, it's approximately $20,000. Yeah. Okay. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. That's $40,000. Yeah. 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 Yeah
we would not have any problem tearing, ripping out whatever. We're good at tearing things up. <laughs> right, right. But I'm just wondering if they would pay, you know, pay to get the concrete, take all that out. That, you know, yeah, that would, we could figure okay. that out. Okay. Uh, in terms of the crossing and what's required, um, you're right that the, the flashing beacons are not required. Um, it is something that we recommend for a road that carries 18,000 vehicles a day. Um, simply putting a crosswalk across the, the road um, and expecting a pedestrian to be able to get across basically 40 feet of pavement without any other protection. Um, there, there's no other level of security whether the striping is there or not. So uh, we would recommend the signage with the RRFBs. Um, I just want to say this is a decision for the city. This, this goes to uh, state statute with traffic control authority. You know, we're making recommendations, but any of these things that are related to traffic control, on uh, Gulf Boulevard, even though it's a county road, the city has the authority to say yes or no, or to make additional recommendations. So that, that's why we're here presenting this. We're not, we're not coming in saying this is what we're going to do. We're, we're seeking your approval before we do anything. Thank you, Tom. Thank you, John. Thank you, Mr. Package, uh, there are standardized evaluation forms for the charter officers uh, for you to look at, and there is a specific section that's job specific. So, although they're standardized, it does each evaluation does have some specificity, specificity to the uh, to each officer's roles or responsibilities. I've gone through these with, with each of the charter officers, and they were generally agreeable to the uh, definitions of the areas of responsibility. And uh, if you, as a group, approve of this format of evaluation, then the proposed timelines would be that February through March, um, we would ask that these evaluations be filled out. There would be three types of evaluations, a self-evaluation, a peer evaluation, and then we as commissioners would fill out the evaluations. At the same time those are getting filled out, there would be salary surveys done for each of the three charter officers, and all of those would be put into a package for us to review in April to give feedback during the budget planning process. So that's that way we won't have any surprise discussions after the budget about salary levels and there will be financial recommendations for salaries before the budget season begins and we will we will be complying with our responsibilities to perform to answer any questions and I wanted to thank uh, uh, Greg and Deanne and Randy for your help in getting these done. Thank you. On the, if I may, Ed, on the old evaluations there was not a peer. Um, I was just curious how that. just thought that would be a way to, sometimes a charter officer has interactions that we as commissioners don't ever see and so uh, Peer evaluation offers the opportunity for us as commissioners to look at a whole set of evaluations and understand and come to a decision as to how we feel the performance of that officer has uh, has been. That's that's the, the idea anyway. We decided against going for a 360 degree evaluation. We had talked about that because of the disparities in the number of people who report to various charters. So we talked about mechanically that one person was potentially going to collect all of these and deliver them. How, so we we would utilize staff for that. They're not they're not um, hidden evaluations or random or random anonymous. Yeah, anonymous. Anonymous. Yes, yes. They're not anonymous. Any other questions? 
other questions for Ed? Yes. We think it's a it's an excellent move uh, forward. I think it's more equitable, um, timely, and it, it uh, certainly it is a fair way to approach this without eleventh <laughs> hour panic as to what we're going to do and why. So I think it's a great improvement. You're to be commended on it. Yeah, great work. Staff did it all. I did it there. <laughs> there to be commended on. Thank you. For the honor and commendation. Uh, so, uh, could we say that we have consensus to proceed with these formats and the schedule that I lay down? Yes.